Our next speaker is Dr. Martha, also known as Marty Burt. She is a consultant of MRB Consulting and affiliated scholar with the Urban Institute, where she was the director of the Social Services Research Program for nearly three decades. Dr. Burt has directed numerous research projects for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and over her distinguished career, Dr. Burt has been instrumental in developing ways to count and describe homeless children and adults, and in examining state policies, legislation, funding, and programs to serve homeless people and to prevent homelessness. She is the author of three books and dozens of articles and reports on homelessness, and she has submitted testimony to or presented before congressional committees numerous times. In 2008, Dr. Burt received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Alliance to End Homelessness. We are also very proud to share that Dr. Burt earned her PhD in sociology right here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she began her lifelong work conducting research about programs to help vulnerable populations, including a study of people leaving Mendota Mental Health Institute at the time. As she explained to me, one of the underlying threads with all of the populations that she has worked with over time, pregnant and parenting teens, high-risk youth, victims of domestic violence, children in the child welfare system, low-income elderly, that is who ends up on the streets. And that is why she has dedicated herself to focusing on evaluation, policy impact, and systems coordination to address these issues. Her talk today is called Ending Homelessness, What the Research Says It Will Take. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marty Burt. Hillary has already told you homelessness, why we're looking at this, why states should care. Homelessness is costly, family, costly families and individuals are affected, child well-being goes way down. Kids who are, uh, child, small children who are homeless or whose mothers were pregnant before, um, homeless while pregnant, um, have about 22% more hospitalizations in their first year and then their first four years than children of the same age whose mothers were not pregnant. And if the mother was pregnant, both, was homeless both while pregnant and after, it's 41% more hospitalizations. And those are very costly. And there are other health effects. Um, homeless children are also more likely to become homeless than adults. And as you've heard from other speakers, it's very expensive um, to have people be homeless as opposed to have them be home. So there's always been some homelessness. Um, and there's a lot of ways that that has been defined over the centuries and in different countries. Um, but there's always been some. We're never going to get it down to absolute zero. Even countries that supply um, guaranteed housing still have a tiny little bit of homelessness. Um, but not since the Great Depression have we seen the trends of the last 35 years, um, which started with the 1981-82 recession. That was the first time that shelters and soup kitchens and skid rows in the few cities around the country that had them uh, began to see women and children on the streets. So the economic effects are very important. There's been a lot of emphasis put on people's individual problems, but really homelessness affects poor people. And the, more, the poorer you are, the worse the economy, the more likely the uh, homelessness is going to go up. You saw those blips out there on um, Adam's charts, especially for balance of state, meaning all out around there. They were in 2007 and especially 2008 and 2009. And what happened in 2008 and 2009? You had the foreclosure crisis. People lost housing. People lost any assets they might have had before. And they ended up homeless. And those are families. Those are not individuals. Um, so the causes of homelessness have been discussed for a very long time. They split out into two main ones, structural, which um, include the cost of housing and the job market and people's earning potential. So there's both a human personal capital side of that and there's what's available out there to um, have a job from. The second major component is individual characteristics. Um, such as very low education, such as um, the effects of violence, such as um, behavioral health issues, substance abuse, mental health, and so on. Then there's chance, 
So if you're a family and you're struggling um, to afford housing and your car breaks down and you can't get to work without your car and you don't have enough money to fix your car, um, you're either going to lose your job or you're going to pay your rent money to fix your car and you're going to be in a very bad place. Um, illness, major illness um, is another kind of thing that, you know, without adequate insurance and so on, people end up um, <coughs> in debt and um, sometimes losing their housing. Public policies can mitigate um, a lot of these different kinds of things. Um, for instance, deinstitutionalized. I noticed you said, what did you call it, Mendota? Mental Health Institute, when I was doing that study, was Mendota State a Hospital. Some of you may remember that. Um, so the whole emphasis on what we do about mental health has changed majorly. And one of the things the state hospitals, however terrible they may have been, did was give people housing and food and sometimes a job. Um, but when those closed and people ended up without that support, many of them ended up in um, single room occupancy hotels for a while, um, or in board and care, getting pretty awful care usually, um, until those places got um, gentrified or upgraded or deleted. And um, much of that housing disappeared in the 70s and 80s, and those people ended up on the streets. Um, if that policy had not happened, if there had been much more of the supportive housing kind of stuff, um, that we have now for, for people coming out of state hospitals, or as we have now actually for people leaving nursing homes, there's a major push to do that, um, they, and we kept it up. They would not have been homeless. So this is an impossible to read slide, um, which you have in your packet, but the critical aspect of it, let me see if I can actually make this work, red dot, household income and availability and cost of housing. And there's an equality or inequality here in the middle of this. And everything on this side are things that affect household income, many of which public policy can make a difference on. And everything on this side is things that affect the availability and cost of housing, especially for people with low income. So um, I leave you to um, either see if you can read that in the reproduction that you have in your packets or um, download it from the website and expand it and so on. But um, all of these things are things that people have looked at, at and, the, and the, this box right here of what can you do about it um, is what I'm mostly going to talk about today. <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me. I have one open down there. See if Jill can grab that. Jill, Jill, can you get me that bottle of water that's open down there? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so between 1960 and 2014, the cost of inflation adjusted cost of rent or housing has gone up 64%. Increase in inflation-adjusted household incomes has gone up 18 percent. Um, the number of cost-burdened renters, and cost-burdened renters in HUD terms, um, which does a biannual study of worst-case housing needs, I mean anybody who is paying over, for the most part, anybody who's paying over 30 percent of their income for rent. It also has a little bit of really bad housing or overcrowding, but most of the cost, most of the burden is the cost burden. Um, in um, 1960, 24% of households were cost burdened, and in 2014, 49% of U.S. households were cost burdened. That's a huge increase. Um, so uh, if it's relevance to homelessness is more households are likely to lose housing, fewer households are likely to get back into housing once they've lost it, because once you're out, you need not just the rent, but you need the deposit, and you need security. Uh, you, well, you need first, land, last, and security deposit. And many programs don't pay for They'll pay the rent, but they won't pay one or the other of those two things. Um, and that also means that fewer households are able to assist family and friends in times of crisis because they themselves are not secure. Whoops. Where was it? 
Okay, so, um, there, okay, sorry. Um, so, what should we do? And we, Adam told you about the current um, homeless assistance program, which has definitely grown greatly in the last 30 years. Um, it has a lot of federal money in it. It has at least as much state and local money in it. In the beginning, it was mostly concentrated, it was all concentrated on people who are currently homeless. Um, very little is actually done on prevention, and prevention we can talk about, but it's really hard to do prevention well without spending a lot of money on households that probably won't lose their housing. Although they're much more attractive usually to public um, opinion than the households that are actually homeless. Um, most existing homeless services do not provide permanent housing, but instead emergency social transitional and rapid rehousing, which even though HUD counts that as being housed, you saw from the family impact study that they're, they remain housed as long as somebody's paying the, some of the rent, but as soon as somebody stops paying some of the rent, often they leave that housing, um, even though they're supposed to be placed in housing that they can presumably take over, but many of them don't, and they um, uh, go back to the risk level for becoming homeless that the usual care people had. Um, so um, there are programs within the homeless system, although the people who are living in them are no longer counted as homeless, because they're not, um, that do work. And there's lots of research to say they work. Permanent supportive housing is one of them. One version of permanent supportive housing is what's called HUD-VASH, which is the Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing Program, which is basically like a Section 8 for veterans, homeless veterans, with officially a lot of supportive services that are supposed to be given. PSH, Permanent Supportive Housing, has a lot of supportive services. Uh, there's, there's help needed to get people into the housing, to help them stabilize in the housing, to help them stay in the housing, to help them keep paying their rent. Um, the, um, whoops, one category of permanent supportive housing is housing first, which is get them into the housing first, work on issues after that, but the housing is the same, has the same retention rules as any tenant. You pay your rent, you don't pull the microwave off the wall, and you don't fight with your neighbors, and you stay. You have a lease, you stay. And then the services help you meet those criteria, if that means drinking less or having a rep payee so that you don't spend all your money on that. That's one thing you could do. If it means taking your meds um, for mental illness, that's another thing you could do. But the basic issue is keep paying your rent and stay in this housing. And anything that helps with that is good. OK. Um, I was asked to say something about youth, um, and this is it. Um, uh, most um, homeless youth, the ones we can count, actually, are the ones that go to runaway and homeless youth shelters. The vast majority of them have a home which it could be safe to go back to if, with enough negotiation and so on. Um, most of them do return home. The second category is those that do not have a home um, or do not home, have a home that is safe to go back to or have um, used to have a home and got kicked out of it. And this is the street population that we have such a hard time finding, but also the population um, that is in, by and large, the most trouble. Um, many of them are already chronically homeless. They have been on the streets for more than a year, and they have a lot of issues. Um, there are, what works for other chronically homeless people works for these kids, coming from a slightly different perspective, so that um, you, um, you have like child welfare agencies, um, public child welfare agencies, or private child support agencies um, partnering with um, the continuums of care and with homeless funding to create permanent supportive housing for youth aging out. Um, and while I say permanent, that just basically means more than the two years you're allowed in transitional, because the hope and the expectation is that these kids do not stay forever, 
but that they need more than two years to get stable. Um, okay, to really end homelessness, evidence-based strategies for increasing the ability of people to afford housing. So that's what we're talking about. Some ways to do that include rent subsidies, improving human capital, job skills, education, developing more jobs so the jobs are out there for people to be able to take, jobs that actually pay enough to afford that two-bedroom apartment. Um, ultimately, research also suggests a need to address the structural problem of housing and housing costs and the, how to create more affordable housing. So. Um, that's what I'm going to talk to about for the rest of this talk, is what can states do to create more affordable housing, and I mean physical units. Subsidies we know work, um, but there aren't enough available units in many communities, even if HUD did, or state, um, state subsidy programs did pay the rent, um, for the people that need them. So I'm talking about actually creating more units as well as subsidizing. Um, so since the early 1980s was, 19, 1900s, sorry, 1900s, like 1910, 1915 was the last time that it was profitable without a subsidy for private developers to build housing that it was explicitly aimed at poor people. Um, since then, you've had, you know, na neighborhood shifts, so poor people take over um, housing that was built for people who had more income. Harlem is the perfect example of that, and now it's going backward, um, so it's gentrifying. Um, so at this point, and probably for at least the last 50 years, building, creating more affordable units takes at least one kind of subsidy. It either takes a rent subsidy or takes a, cons a construction development subsidy or it takes both. Um, so if, if you're talking about low income housing tax credits, which I know the state has used um, effectively, their aim, even their poorest stuff is aimed at 80% of AMI maybe some at 50% of AMI, but we're talking about people, homeless families, that are at 15% of AMI. They can't afford those affordable units without a subsidy, so they would need both. Um, so just recognize that this is not an unusual or even a new circumstance um, that subsidizing either the creation or occupancy of housing units is really necessary if that 75% of people eligible for um, housing subsidies now don't get them or to get them. In other words, that we could meet this nation's what Hutton calls the worst case housing needs. And the worst case is that they're paying more than 50% of almost no money to begin with for housing. Um, so, what we're doing is we're using subsidies. They can do, include all kinds of things. They can include communities giving public land, leasing public land for 99 years, all kind, you know, acquiring public land, acquiring um, brown fields and getting, you know, unpoisoning them and using that, that land. There's all kinds of strategies going around. And subsidizing of the household once they're there. Um, so how can a state um, move towards stimulating enough housing that is where it's needed? In other words, where jobs are or where you can create jobs. Where transportation is or where you can create transportation affordable to people earning below 50% of AMI with a significant chunk for those earning less than 30% and has predictable and reasonable tr production trajectory. It doesn't take decades. It doesn't um, entangle, it doesn't you know, take 20 jurisdictions to agree, it doesn't take 20 agencies to agree, et cetera. Um, so um, there are some, many states that are doing something and some states that are doing a lot. Um, whoop. Uh, 
principles that seem to work best are to have a statewide or regional, or regional plan, to have some um, uh, defensively based allocation of fair share housing, so every community in the state or the region has a share that they need to take, that it's enforceable, that is uh, the result of collective planning and collaboration in production between public and private, um, reduced regulatory barriers to zoning, to construction codes, um, to um, the number of jurisdictions you have to go through. Some places have created um, special committees and commissions that have representation from regional entities that can fast track um, affordable housing development that work on multiple goals simultaneously. So you do this with like economic development and housing or child welfare and health and housing. So you have partners um, and you have um, other agencies and other um, constituencies that can support this. New Jersey is probably the best example of the first several of quite a few of these. It, is, it, it has a um, statewide plan. It involves all jurisdictions. It's the fair share of each jurisdiction is established. It's enforceable. It's in law. There's a, a commission that oversees it. Um, it works. They've uh, helped over 60,000 families in the last 15 years um, get into housing that is near transportation, that is close to jobs and other stuff like that across the whole state. Many jurisdictions have something called inclusionary zoning, um, which would mean that any development that a private developer does is supposed to have a certain percentage of affordable units that the effectiveness of that, there's some research out there, and it's very mixed. It depends on, first of all, what the percentage is. If it's 5% of your units, it's going to make a lot less difference than if it's 30%. If it's targeted at 80% or 120% of AMI, it's going to make a lot less, dif more, less difference than if it's targeted at 50% or 30%. Um, and even with inclusionary zoning, um, so it depends on where it is. It depends on how it's enforced. Many of the communities with inclusionary zoning have a lot of wiggle room for developers, so it doesn't actually hit the people we're talking about. Subsidies are still needed, probably both for production and rent. Um, OK, so here are some things that, that this is coming from a National Governors Association report. Um, but there's no reason why a legislature couldn't um, enact a, re a requirement that some of these things be done, and then it becomes the responsibility of state agencies to do. Expedited permitting with increased proportion of afford the more affordable units you include, the faster you get through. Um, specialized building codes for redevelopment areas, um, which have in New Jersey have cut costs by 40%. In other communities, I've listed some of the states, by between 10 and 40%. Um, so, especially if you're doing old buildings, this means you don't have to bring them up to today's code. You have to make them safe, but you don't have to do absolutely everything that is in today's code. And usually that is coupled with um, economic redevelopment, school push, a lot of community involvement. Incentivizing housing development that follows transportation lines, partnering with overlapping interests. I've already me mentioned some of those. Most states have looked. Have, have looked at federal sources, but there are many state-funded programs, even locally ones. Um, OK, here are some that New Jersey uses. Trust funds. They have a general affordable housing trust fund and a special needs house. Uh, state-funded. This is all state-funded. Um, they have a deep subsidy program. So when they're doing developments that aim at 30% of AMI, they put more money into the production subsidy. Land acquisition programs so that there's land that they can give to um, developments. They have their own tax credit program, um, as well as federal. They have a special program for small projects. So for small communities, five to 25 units. Um, they have a housing preservation program, which doesn't actually mean physical preservation. It means keeping anything that's already affordable, like project-based section, project -based section eight, affordable. And they have a loan program for housing for youth aging out of foster care that also supports housing. Um, 
so I'm going to skip that slide. That's about the individual factors. Um, so preventing homelessness is the most cost-effective thing to do if we can do it. But well, in one sense it is. But uh, to do that, you have to improve the equation between housing costs and housing income. So. Um, programs that specifically try to prevent homelessness by trying to figure out who is going to become homeless largely can't target well enough to predict that. Um, so these much more universal, let's help everybody with the worst case housing need and then we'll get more stable, um, are the way to go if we can figure out how to do it. Um, so is that all? That's it. I did it. I got my 30 second and I'm done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Burt.